Welcome everyone to another Transatlantic Poetry Broadcast. My name is Robert Peek, creator of the series. And uh, tonight I'm delighted to be welcoming Geraldine Green, who's joining us from Cumbria in the UK, in the northern part of England, and George Wallace, who's at the Walt Whitman Birthplace on Long Island in the state of New York. Um, so just a reminder of the format tonight, each poet will be reading uh, for about 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, their own work and new work and whatever they like, uh, and then that the remainder of the hour we'll use for Q and A, live Q and A, taking your questions over the air. So, um, as we go along, if you do have a, a thought, a question, a comment, um, there's a little yellow Q and A uh, button on your uh, YouTube video feed. You can also put those into the Google Plus event page or tweet with the hashtag hashtag TA Poetry TA as in transatlantic. Poetry. And we'll pick those up and, and we'll get to the questions near the end. But first, um, it's really my pleasure to welcome Geraldine Green, who will read for us first. So uh, Geraldine, as I mentioned, um, comes from the UK. She's the writer in residence at Brantwood, which is the former home of John Ruskin, and that's in Coinston, in Cumbria. Um, she's performed and she's been anthologized widely in the US, in the UK, and uh, in various parts of Europe. She has four poetry pamphlet collections out with Flare Stack Publications, Pelores Publications, and Swarthmore Hill Press. And her two full-length collections are The Other Side of the Bridge on Salt Road, and those were um, by Indigo Dreams in 2012 and 2013. She's an associate editor of Poetry Bay, and she's coming to us now from her home up north in Cumbria. Geraldine? Oh, Geraldine, you're muted. Go ahead and hit that mute button, and then we can hear you. Hi, Robert. Hello, George. You're on. Hello. Um, it's good to be reading with you again, George. Um, Robert, thank you for inviting me along. Um, good afternoon and good evening. I'm going to read a poem from a new collection, and then read from my recent collections, um, Salt Road and the Other Side of the Bridge. Um, I'll start with my new one, which is Juniper, Craghead. Juniper, Craghead. I'd like to sleep beneath this ancient juniper, twisted as it is, bent low by prevailing westerlies, blown in from the Irish sea, and busy for one night only, or perhaps more, if I were brave enough. If I were underneath this old tree's sanctuary, this evergreen that cattle have trod around, this keeper of flame, this incense tree, this maker of gin and dreams and love that has seen many winters, I'd like to sleep beneath its twisted protectiveness, wake to see the morning, gold or fog-ridden, wake to look across the water, and see the old man of Coniston, to wake after sleep beneath this ancient juniper, twisted as it is, breathe in its incense. These next uh, few poems are from my collection Salt Road and The Other Side of the Bridge. And this first one is called, I Used to Know These Things. I used to know these things, the season for shrimps and a sign chalked on a blackboard, shrimps, second cottage on right. The names of trees in Bardsey Woods, I used to know them, I used to know these things. The name of Bill Stables, his dog that trotted behind him as he rode his bike to Baker to catch the tide and the sight of Gillam padding barefoot round his grocery shop in town. I used to know the feel of a lapping chip in my hand, the taste of wild strawberries, the taste of a new laid egg my dad had found in the hedge on his way home from the ship at Blackso. I used to know the feel of wind on my skin when I ran through Bracken, the smell of mud, its sour salt tang, and the sound of the buzzer at Vickers shipyard, the sight of thousands of men pouring out through the yard's iron gates, on foot, on bikes, in cars. 
The sight of the first primrose, hidden among gorse, on the railway embankment, and always a kestrel hanging on the wind above the cliff top, always the sound of the Irish sea, and always that taste, sweet as a nut, with freshly peeled shrimps, hauled in, loaded onto tractors, driven over mud flats across the bay, I used to know. I'm very much influenced by um, poetry of um, indigenous American Indian um, poets and writers. And this next poem, All Day I Sit in the Woods, um, came about through reading a poem um, by Louise Erdrich called Jack Light. And it was a line, we have come to the edge of the woods, that actually prompted this poem. All day I sit in the woods, dreaming. All day and all night I sit, my hair on fire with the wind. All day I sit and sing. All day I sit, my back against this pine. My breathing slows, becomes sap that oozes up and down the tree's spine. All day I sit and sing my back to the wind. All day and all night, the flashlights green as northern lights. All night, I and the pines weave a song from alders and willows that live below the horizon. All day I claw my mind to the top of the woods. My hands somersault over and under become a tapestry of limbs. I and the wind and the pines discover each other again. Discover the smell of men, their cigarette breath, their unhinged shotgun fingers triggered crooked. All day I sit and weave the wind. My hair becomes very lichen. I hang from branches. My name now is no name. My body is white and silver. My name is Birch and Alder. My tongue the sound of finches. My feet sown deep into earth. All day I grow deeper. Pause for a glass of water, excuse me. Um, the next poem is called We Just Strove and it talks about a night of no moon, which it was actually written in response to when it was a full moon. And I actually drove uh, my husband and poet friends across the cold Beck Fells from Carlisle back to Keswick, part of the way with no headlights on, just in the full light of the full moon. This poem is called You Just Drove. It was a night of no moon, a night of fresh earth. It was night, and we just strove. You pointed out Scotland. Under a thin strip of light, we could see cripple across the solway. We just drove. There was mist, there was silence, there was fruitfulness in the silence. We drove through it all. The sheep, the night of no moon, the grasses, we just drove through it, turned the fells into commons of prayer, turned them into our road home, turned the headlights off, bumped over the cattle grid, over the little white road, across the fells. My husband Jeff and I were really enjoyed our visits to North America, whether it's on the East Coast, the West, the Midwest, and our, especially our time at the Woody Guthrie Festival. And one night we were actually driving back from the Woody Guthrie Festival, we got to our friend uh, Carol Hamilton's home, where we were all staying, and the aircon had um, broken, and it was about 180 
and it was midnight and hot. This next poem is called Oklahoma Night. Sitting here, watching a daddy long legs spin against the window from a thin thread of spider twine, I rise and go outside, slip into a white hammock strung between two posts of chicory in a small backyard Oklahoma City. You come out and say, oh, you look so pretty lying there. You just enjoy the song of that old mockingbird. And I take your advice. I doze on the strung out hammock, white as a new moth cocoon, and mockingbird, he sings from the top of his telegraph post. He sings his mad fool heart, right out his breast, tips his tail, bobs his head, looks around east and west, no sign of a mate. So he changes his tune. He sings like a robin, sings like a siren, sings like an apple tree in spring. And he sang that night when the air con broke, and we lay looking out our open window with the bared bones of prairie, mosquito nets covering our skin, and that tomfool bird mocking us in the cocoon dark of an Oklahoma night. Um, the next couple of poems, there's three more. As I say, we've had the pleasure, um, Jeff and I, of spending time with friends on Long Island, New Jersey, um, the Midwest, Oklahoma, Kansas. But one very special occasion was um, when I actually was invited to read as part of the Walking with Whitman series. And this next poem is called Walt. 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 You with your jaunty smile, your hat on one side, a wide brimmed wind blowing you over the hemsteads. You with your blackthorn stick and your stride, your billowing voice lamenting the parting of seabirds. Your arms like happy windows, waving to the sea, the air, the land, the railroads and soldiers. You with your laughing beard, bearing your chest, as you make your way around the boundaries of oceans. You, Walt Whitman, of the long line and tumbling somersaults of tender poetry, with your working man's hands and your mystery, in the digging of graves and gardens, in the planting of trees, here on your beloved Long Island. Buried deep in your heart of lobsters and clams, the King James Bible walks with each step you make as you mark the bounds, smiling as you see someone you know. A woman, an old man, a prophet, a hobo. You walk, pray to the sea and the air as I do, bending your knees to better understand the blades of grass. And finally, a poem called Liverpool. It's from my husband Jeff, who's from Liverpool, and all our wonderful um, friends and family. Liverpool. With your flags and cathedrals, your hands across the water, your ferry boats and needling scouse human, pans filled with copper, scoured raw by pieces of silver, from West India and Africa, and spices and donuts, and here in the cot we chant you alive each Saturday in our red strip. And the top is sweet as blue honey, oldest football team in the country. Ever turn, ever turn, ever turn, Liverpool, chanting over the Mersey where monks used to ferry, and Oliver Cromwell fought the Cavaliers in the green fields of Bromber on the Wirral sister peninsula. And the banks of the Mersey saw bloodshed and fighting, and the Irish came and settled 
and added to the glory and the mud and the guineas and the songs and the tapestry of our gorgeous Liverpool home that sings itself alive with each twist and turn of the tide and the river, the river that sends its heartbeats far and wide America, China, India and they all come to you Liverpool great mother-loaded city of the Atlantic Northwest oh, you silver mudded ferried light filled Mersey carrying in music and giving yourself in culture your twin cathedrals guarding Hope Street and the liver birds proud as laurel crown baths posing on some of the finest architecture in Europe and one of the seven wonders of the world dancing in St George's Hall a hallowed place famous for its infamous trials and the young boy and his dad flying their kite on your banks one evening in November yes you've seen it all great river Holes, mother of mercied rawness, buried beneath your alluvial soil, like the bones of sailors, heroes, footballers, dreams, dream sellers, musicians, martyrs, echoing and swinging over the mercy, buried from side to side in the great swing and roar of your tides. Your mouth has seen battleships and cruise liners in its time, and will see more. Dockers, strikers, rockers, rollers, priests, reformers, Felicia Hemans, Bessie Braddock, John Lennon, 8 from 8 in 2008. And as beat poet Allen Ginsberg said, Liverpool, you are the centre of consciousness of the human universe. And the river rolled and sighed, and the people cheered, and I heard my husband's old dad cry, oh yes as he drove his black taxi round his beloved city, Liverpool. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Geraldine. That was lovely. So next, it's my pleasure to introduce George Wallace. Uh, George is joining us from the Walt Whitman birthplace in Long Island, where he's a writer in residence. and. Um, has been writer in residence since 2011. He's also the National Beat Poetry Festival laureate um, and an author of 29 chapbooks. Yes, 29 chapbooks. He's an adjunct professor of English at Pace University and he earned his MFA degree at Pacific University studying with Marvin Bell, David St. John, and Joseph Millar. George tours the US and the UK each year, reading from his own work, conducting workshops, lecturing on various literary topics, and we're delighted to welcome him here tonight from, or today, in his part of the world, from the Walt Whitman birthplace. George? Yes, Robert, thank you so much. It's today in North America. Not, it's not tonight yet. The only time I ever hear this place called North America is when I hear from somebody from England. It's nice to hear that. I like it. Um, you know, uh, I've had a lot of opportunities to, uh, to work with you, Robert. We've done a show here together with uh, Greg Pardler, which is very exciting. And uh, you yourself featured here at the Wall Birthplace. So you know, we've done a, lot of, done a lot of good things together. So thank you for, for being a friend. And Geraldine, of course, you know, we've been uh, working together for 15 years, I think it is, you know, probably 15 years. She mentioned Oklahoma, the Woody Guthrie Festival. She didn't have a chance to talk about the Gordon Parks Museum in Kansas, which is an amazing experience. Uh, William Carlos Williams Center in Rutherford, New Jersey, or Lowell Celebrates Kerouac for that matter. Just It goes on and on. And also at the Ruskin Center and uh, George Fox's place, Swarthmore Hall, and other locations around the UK. So Robert Burns Center. So just a tremendous uh, work we've done together. It's great to be. Even though I can't see right now, Geraldine, on my screen, I know you're listening. And it was great to hear some of your poems. The Liverpool poem, fabulous. You know, all of those really, really very fine poems. So I have, what, 15, 20 minutes to read a few poems, and I'll do that. 29th and 30th chapbook, which is uh, due out August 15th. And today is, what, uh, July what, 16th? So about a month till my 30th collection comes out, so I'm very excited about that. This poem I wrote actually for my father, it's very recent, it's called Poem in the Coffee Pot, and it's about immigrants. 
Life was good, it was finally good. There was God on the popcorn, poems in the coffee pot. There was sandlots and cracker jacks and pickle jars and pitchers of beer. There was tenements and bosses and Coney Island holidays. And the immigrants came and the immigrants came in their immigrant pants and their immigrant dresses. And they built New York out of glass and steel in their own immigrant image. Olive oil, eggplant, prayer shawl, candelabra, chicken fat and wine, and they kept on coming. And they kept on coming with their accents and their operatics and their strange music halls and melodramas and stubborn political sciences. Eastern Europeans, Southern Europeans, Polish, Russian, Italians, Jews, Greeks, Germans, and they kept their big traps shut when they were forced to, but they stuck to their guns, and they took the dirty jobs in the dirty factories, and the lights went out on Saturday night at a quarter past ten, and bedposts shook, and radiators rattled like an elevated railway and late-night jazz. And the stubborn lights of New York City, glittering like a knife, thrust deep into the heart of heaven. And the immigrants of New York City wrestled with each other in the dead of night for love, for loss, for consolation, for unreasonable, unstoppable, unnatural hope. You know, recently I've started uh, teaching, two years now, teaching at Westchester Community College in addition to Pace University, which means that instead of taking the train to Manhattan, I have to drive. And so I usually an early morning drive, and I get to uh, listen to uh, uh, a lot of jazz, and a lot of jazz that uh, WKCR, which is a radio station at Columbia University, is a lot of jazz. So my new collection has a lot of jazz poems in it. But Actually, before I read that, I'm going to read for my 29th collection, which is only about two months old, Drugged by Hollywood. You can see that right here, Drugged by Hollywood. My fifth collection with um, Night Ballet Press and Diana Borsenic in Cleveland. So the title poem is Drugged by Hollywood. This one's for you, Robert, being a California product. I was drugged by Hollywood when I was six, abducted raped and systematically made a slave. My youth, my body, my hands in my own hands, none of it my own. I was drugged by Hollywood while my parents were asleep or looking the other way. They knew what was happening. And I am still drugged. Whatever I tell you, whatever anyone has to say, all this is not my own. These kids, these lovers, these poems, these crimes, all this property called George. I was drugged by Hollywood. I was drugged by Hollywood. And I have been forced to do Hollywood's bidding my entire life. And this poem from uh, Drugged by Hollywood, Night Ballet Press some accidental category of miracles. This is, uh, I wrote this while I was at the Center for Hellenic Studies in Washington, D.C. So um, in some ways I'm trying to pick up on ancient Hellenic uh, ideas of aging, love, aging, and death in this poem. Some accidental category of miracles. It is all audible to me, the alchemy and the telling, triumpho de l'amour, the secret telling, the terrible rosebud of your heart, volcanic, circular as a jeweler's saw, the robust harmony, the melodramatic padlock of your circumstances, even the sharp intake of your breath, all audible, all audible. I could listen for hours all night in the darkness, the shape of your living breath, a candle flame, terrible majesty, anything could move me right now, what your lips say. What's your tongue? What's your tongue? What's your teeth? How they shape the darkness? How in the darkness of night you are the dispeller of gloom? An otter slipping through river mist, blue smoke from a cabin fire, 
sunburst which has been held up in the cloud for years. This longing to be inside you, restless, restless. To feed and to kiss your secret mouth, to be an otter to your muskrat, rainbow trout, luna, to be fed and kissed by you tell you unspeakable things, sacred things, all foolish, all audible, these eyelids, these hands, this fluttering of wings on the tip of my tongue, at the base of my spine, where my manhood begins. I can taste this silver going, this snow melt surging, these your earrings, these your pearls, I place them in my mouth, I fill my nostrils with them, they're pitiless breathing, for you a rock to cradle, for you a river to rock, for you merciful, uh, your lips, your tongue, your teeth, your hair. Midnight approaches, molding of contours. In my imagination I'm ten feet tall, and naked and yours. This falls outside the category of miracles and makes light of material day. This zone, this hoof print, this persistent stomping of shard and rock, some accidental category of miracles, this triumph over the natural order of you, inside you, beside you, fill my lungs, this will all make sense, this will all make me weep, this will make the crying of foxes palatable. The field and the restless woods hold me. A brace of pheasants moves along the edge of a cornfield. I lean my ear closer to you, the whir of your voice in your throat, like a thistle breather, all audible, all audible, this eternity, this first embracing, all miraculous, and new, and forever audible, to me this flight of birds, to me this fall of alpine water, winds and cries and ice melt, ice melt, and river rock, I hear it all tonight, and you lying here beside me, your extraordinary breathing your tender gasps of miraculous wonder. Book 30. A simple blues of a few intangibles. Like I say, jazz. So, on KCR, there's a guy who uh, is a total jazz expert, Phil Schaff, and I listen to him every morning as I'm trying to get to work at uh, Westchester Community College. So, a lot of his poems are jazz related. A simple blues with a few intangibles. What Johnny Jackson had been playing. All night long and all his life in a one room walk up, beating on a steam pipe with a heel of his shoe. Nothing much on his mind except working the back room. A beat sort of gentleman with a chill in the bebop. A blues sort of gentleman, positively anarchistic and wise. Oh man, uh, what a cool bohemian. And beat to the bone. How he worked that tune, no more, no less than the music of the universe, passing through that man, or Helen Ginsberg's human universal universe for that matter, from the gods and for them and for the people too. It was always about the people. It was always about the people Johnny crooned, running new chords and old chords and no chords over his tongue like the Midas of Midnight, a simple blues with a few intangibles in the solitude of his own sweet madness, at home with the moon. This is probably, you know, you know, when you have collections come together, sometimes they come from poems that are a little bit old. So most of my poems that I read are very recent. This one's a year old, maybe. October runs like a bebop Shakespeare. It's about going upstate, leaving the city. 
October doesn't mean much to me anymore. Not in the city with its heavy-handed women, lazy umbrellas and long green mushroom people. Not in the suburbs with its doormats and SUVs. Autumn doesn't do it like it used to. I need to go up country, pop wilderness into my mouth, cohabitate with the psychedelic earthworms, be one with the mushrooms that glow, get post-apocalyptic, jam to the jar and back again. Just with a fennel, go okra rot with a hog-eyed snake and cozy with crab apples. The rainy, dark pulp of autumn's my resurrection. I drool it down my neck. Away with the ugly city and its men in sheep's clothing, dead zone advertisements and terrible manners. Come agitate the gravel with me. Brothers, sisters, I know the devil when I see him. Devil, have your day, but go ahead and spit back at man in his work. But leave the gods alone. Leave the gods alone. When a man returns to the wilderness, he becomes a little god. When a woman returns to the wilderness, she becomes great lord to another day dawning. Earth's a swollen, playful thing when death seems near. Earth's belly's full and alive with plenty of rhizome yet for you and for me. Spawn of three-seated mercury, asters, tick seed, and goldenrod. Uh, let's wave with the chipmunks, slime along like an omnisexual slug. Let's go spittle to mold, mold a molecule, man to man, cloud to toe, and back again. It's all right here in the fallen leaves for the asking brother. All right here with the bees and bugs, sister. Bees, bugs, rain, and death, death in brilliant transfiguration. So trial out to the sugar maples. Let's go running like Bebop Shakespeare in deep October. Naked through the forest with hairy armpits and bosoms flying while tulip trees do their academic dance in the heavy scented dew. Sly in the mist and crafty too. Let's go up country with the newts and possums. Throb and stop with the wild grapes. Let's go scour the underbrush, foxy as musk. Roll in order, rust with the woolly bears. A duet with you. A duet with you. I want to drink you, sister. Drink your eyebrows up, your curly hairs, your ample architecture. I want to taste you, brother. Devour the sweat and bare fat of your dirt-flecked chest. Stride manfully with me, manfully through the wilderness. Only the boldest rituals would do. Check the time. We got three thirty-two. Okay, time for two more poems. No poem actually from a previous collection, Night Ballet Press, about buckles and Bibles. I brought this out because of our trip to uh, Kansas, which is part you know, that uh, Geraldine and Jeff and I took. The belt, 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 belt buckles and Bibles, Johnny Chisholm wandered clear across the high prairie selling Bibles and belt buckles. It was a long time ago. He was a preaching man, no sir, just an ordinary fellow like you or me, trying to make his way through the lonesome world uh, to a service and feed a family besides. Hell's bells, could that boy sell? Six months into that little operation, his the sun rose and fell on Johnny Chisholm's buckles. It danced from belt to belt across the high prairie to the state line in fine or stormy weather. By the time he sold a half a dozen Bibles to some chickens. Soon after that, there was a rebirth of faith and decent expectations in every town and crossroads and the commutation of naked souls was back on the table because, as we all know, there's only two things a man can need if he aims to please his wife and maintain his dignity, a belt buckle and a Bible. And yeah, whether you agree with what Johnny Chisholm was selling or not, just didn't seem to, be, seem to pay no mind to the people of the great state of Kansas because a healthy dose of free enterprise and ample supply of natural charm was all we ever needed or was looking for ever since that boy walked out into this world of farmers and the cattlemen, the bankers and the town folk. This great land has had two things that they can stand up for, praise on Sunday and hang their hats on, not to mention keep their britches up with in a dust storm or it's during a state or local election. And that's Bibles and Belt Buckles. All right, and I'll wrap it up. It's 21st century celebration. Off-road, four-wheel, busted-up collarbone, roll bar, Miss America. She loved a dune buggy. She loved to ride. So to be outside 
to cry, to hop like a toad, to burn like a barn, oh, shoot, like Novocaine, spit in the bushes, spit on the mountaintop, on the prairie, on the bayou, into the mouth hole of the universe. She loved Shenandoah, Mississippi, Oklahoma. She loved hot wheel, all terrain, suit terrain, all weather, suit terrain, space jam. Rain, 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 top down, who the piston busting woman of the blue sky. A real home, a real home. Her tight tack, shoe shine, shotgun shack home was on the range, and oh, she loved her own thick hair like nobody's business. She combed it back, she let it go. She combed it back. She let it go wild. She tossed it back like a steel drum band, like a backdoor Catholic, prophylactic Mormon, figure eight little Miss Pagan America. Crazy, drunk, entitled Mademoiselle. Crazy, drunk, or spying on her own sweet self. Oh, no, no, no. The campfires do not go out on you, little Miss America. The embers do not go out on you. No, not on you. Not the lights on Broadway. Not the pool hall lights, not the jailhouse lights, not the junkyard lights or the headlights left all night long in the supermarket parking lot, and oh, her ghoulish temper, and oh, her talking back, and her racked up men with metallic skin, skinny men, fat men, muscle-headed men, men like sheets of gold, uh, nobody could stop her. No titanium grease gun feedback. Bag. Joe, no coke, dust, dipstick, tin, shield, sawdust, sheriff. And here's what's important. She loved herself. She loved herself. Her body, her muscles, her calves, her skin, ankles, thigh, hip, high heel boots. She shuddered and she waved like the prairie grass that she secretly wanted to be. She loved to be outside. She loved, she loved, she loved, and she needed to be loved, and she shoved it around, and she took it out, and she got took, got lost, got rediscovered, wasted, and found, ripped open, given away, put up on a pedestal, took for a ride, stolen in the night, but she yacked it all out, every ounce of it. The flesh, the earth, the river, the rain, the red rock forest of oak, she plummeted like eagles, she grew like silver corn, she spooned up asphalt and plowed it back under and tucked it away and bombed and bombed and bombed unfairly, unwisely, arrogantly, which is normal and faulty in human too, and acted foolish when she wanted to and wise when you didn't expect it. Off road four wheel busted up collarbone, roll bar, Miss America. Tossed her helmet 50 feet up in the air, caught it in her right hand just like this, and a big yahoo, pop fly, six pack, beanbag woman, headphones blaring, dung busting, crazy, headed off to anywhere, doomed as a devil dog, a little Miss Paradise, leaped out of the dark and into the sun. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, George. That was terrific. So, uh, for the remainder of the hour, we have some questions that have been rolling in from people tuned in and listening to the broadcast. So, um, let's kick off with some of those. Um, Annetta in Germany asks, what's the worst piece of poetry-related writing advice that you've ever received? I think that's a great question. Um, let's start with you, Geraldine, because we just heard from George. Geraldine, what's the worst piece of poetry related writing advice you've ever received. Oh, and you need to unmute there. Um, I think many years ago, um, somebody said to me in a rather patronizing tone, good poems are not born and read easily, Geraldine. I was like, oh, okay. Um, I guess the person meant, hey, you enjoy writing poetry and you write it fast and you get lots of material and that obviously can't be good poetry. Uh, I was like, well, you know, I know you've got to edit and polish, etc, etc, but it's good to just play with language and rhythm and sound, get the material out there, then go back and do the editing and polishing and rearing the poems. Um, I think that's Probably the worst bit. <laughs> any any advance on that, George? George, what do you think? Bad. Yeah, that's pretty bad. I like that. Oh, mine's um, you know, uh, the worst advice I ever heard was write what you know. As far as I'm concerned, you should write what you can imagine. 
because you should be you should be chasing the the uh, the subject and the attitude and the uh, uh, and the product itself. If you write what you know, you never move from the you never move off the dot. So <clears throat> it doesn't you can, you can trust your if you can trust your imagination, it's as authentic as anything else. Yes, I do. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, it does link, I think, with um, having some fun with language, play with it, enjoy it. You know, be a child again. That's mighty pennyworth, isn't it? Fantastic. So, if we were to flip that around into the some, some better writing advice, as it were, it would be to uh, to to be be free. Uh, to write whatever you feel like and to trust your imagination. That's, that's true. I think that, that forms some very good writing advice as it, as it happens. That's great. Uh, uh, Rich, go ahead, Richard, yeah. Richard Hugo talks about, um, about uh, the triggering town. He talks about you know, following, you know, when, you, when you're writing a poem, you're following a trout upstream you know, to the destination. Yeah, great stuff. Great stuff. I agree with him. Wonderful. Um, so next next question that's come in, uh, Valerie in London. What is question? What was your first creative experience? However you want to interpret that, or maybe the first creative experience you can remember, right? You know, whatever you consider a creative experience. I chose to start with you this time. What was your first creative experience? And the other part of that question, how did it influence you after that? My first create, Alice? Alice? Creative experience, whatever you want to consider a creative experience. Experience being creative, doing something creative. Hmm. Well, I mean, I could talk practically. You know, a, a, a craftsman, you know, craftsman-like activity or an artistic activity. I was playing music at the age of four, reading music. So, I mean, you know, that way, you know, there was a there was a, a field of, of creative activity that I was pursuing at the age of four. But I mean, to my first creative act was. The first creative act is when you recognize that you have to manufacture your know, meaning and and uh, and and, uh, and and emotional import to what you're experiencing in life, and that's something that happens as an infant. We all experience that. You know, the, I think a better question is when did you lose it, and what do you have to do to get it back? Great. All right. Well, Jardine, what about you? Um. I'll answer kind of, I'll start with George's last comment about how to get it back. Um, I do think being in a group of writers and perhaps going to write creative writing workshops, having some fun, etc., and playing with it, it can help get that monkey off the shoulder and allow yourself to be a child again. But to go back to the original question from Valerie in London, um, I think I was seven when I wrote my first poem. And it was in response to what I suppose has influenced me since then, in, not just with poetry, but in a spiritual, not in a pretentious spiritual, but in a kind of spiritual way. And it was an experience I've written about in Salt Road. And it was um, an encounter with silver birches in Bardsley Woods, our local woods. And I felt that I was like, hypnotized by the swaying branches. And I felt if I let go, I would become the virtues. That's wacky. And for a seven-year-old, it was quite scary. And a few weeks later, we were asked at school, at ju uh, junior school, primary school, to write a poem. And I actually wrote about these silver virtues. And from then on, it, that's been kind of a, an itch to kind of scratch and to understand and explore. So that's very much um, been an influence in my creative journey. Wow, thank you. That's wonderful. I'm reminded that the Cheshul Milosh poem poetry reminds us how difficult it is to remain one person. It sounds like for you it's it was an experience of being difficult to remain even one species or even one, <laughs> <laughs> one consciousness yet at all. That's and that part of the poetry. Yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. Well actually that, that kind of leads in nicely. I'd love to know more about how the natural world influences your work and your writing, because that's that seems to be a very prominent theme. Um, I well, uh, I don't think I've changed much in a sense, because my two favourite subjects at school were uh, nature writing and poetry, and now I'm actually doing both um, with my own work, 
Uh, I'm exploring prose poetry now. So it, it, it's not only the natural world, um, it's also people, stories, and uh, sense of themselves and belonging or alienation from a particular way. And that's something I explored when I did my PhD. Um, it was exploring uh, identity and the environment through poetry. And I love, on our travels, one of the beauties is meeting other people and listening to their stories. Just listening to people and listening to their pride in a sense of place or belonging or concerns and worries or alienation um, and just generally exploring identity through place and being aware of respect of other people's places and stories. Fantastic. Thank you. George, I'm very interested in the relation to your relationship to music. So, you know, you, you mentioned playing an instrument as a very small child and, of course, the blues and jazz appear frequently in your work. What's the, what's the interrelationship there between poetry and music for you? Well, I'm, I'm a music-based writer, so, I mean, the, 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 um, the music of a phrase or um, uh, is what gets me started in, in the writing process. And that, that, that prefigure, that prefigure is what it is that I write. So rather than letting the intellectual meeting or the, you know, of a, a particular idea direct where I'm going, um, I allow the other uh, music to help to materialize a topic. The music itself is what, uh, what gets it going. I do have a point of view about nature, though, I mean, because I do love nature. And so it's, at that point, you know, you know, I remember I lived in San Francisco and uh, and uh, decided I want to go uh, camp in, in uh, Joshua Tree National Monument. And so I loaded up this Carmen Gia back in the 70s with a, uh, with a picnic gear and you know, picnic stuff and, uh, and drove however many hours it was you know, down Death Valley or whatever. It was with five, I finally got to Joshua Tree. It was anticipating having this wonderful, beautiful you know, camping experience. And, you know, the campsite was completely made of rock, and there was no place to put, hit the tent pegs into the rock, and you just could not set up the tent. Furthermore, there was there were signs all over the campgrounds that do not kill the rattlesnakes. This is after driving for 10 hours to get to there, so I... Um, I, I, I figured, well, I'll, I'll eat at least, but by then the chicken, the raw chicken that I had back at Carmageddon and driving through Death Valley had cooked. It was a completely rock taste. So I just, I <laughs> threw all that stuff away. I got back in the car and I drove to Las Vegas. And went there. So that's my idea of nature. It doesn't cooperate with you. <laughs> the nature doesn't always cooperate with you. Yeah. <laughs> so it starts with, but it starts with the music for you, George. It sounds like it sounds like it starts with. I am very much so. You're something, you feel something. Yeah, just, you know, being in New York, I'm a performance based. You know, I do a lot of performance poetry. And uh, poetry read, read before people is uh, fundamental to what I do, the ways I do with this all. So <clears throat> to me, it needs to, uh, it needs to communicate that way. Yeah. And Geraldine, mm -hmm. it sounds like it starts often for you more with, with an experience or with a place or with people's experience of place, that, 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 that the stories of, of, of being either connected or alienated from the land are, are mm -hmm. very central to what you're doing. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I think that's a good, a good comment and summation of it. Um, the other thing that really interests me, and I just love, is people's voices, accents and dialects, um, colloquial, um, you know, everyday talk, and I love using that in a poem. It was very interesting when I was putting together a set for this evening's or this afternoon's reading, and I was almost read a couple of poems in Cumbrian dialect, and I thought, no, that might be pushing it a bit too much. But I am interested in um, how language grows out of the place, but also evolves and develops as different people come in through migration, immigration. And the, everybody lends their own en energy and um, change in language, uh, and it goes into the mix, into the alchemy. I think that's very special, uh, and I welcome, I embrace that. I do with that, the music of people's voices. Yeah. And so we're back to the music again, the music of speech and of everyday idiom. Wonderful. 
George, um, I, I think at this point you guys know each other you know, very well, but I'm wondering if you have maybe a question for each other that you'd like to ask. George, anything you'd like to ask uh, Geraldine about her work and her process? And about her process? Ooh, not about her process, about her work. Yeah, I mean, she does so many great things, and it's really sad that I haven't had an opportunity to come visit this year. <clears throat> Hopefully next year we'll be able to do that. But in the meantime, um, <clears throat> I am interested in how Everton is doing, <clears throat> Everton and Liverpool, and whether the football teams are doing well this year or have done well. Did I lose her? <laughs> she's on mute. Uh, she's on mute, but I think she's stunned. I think if you weren't on mute, she'd uh, you'd be getting an well, earful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> How's Everton doing? I'll, I'll just ask Jeff. I can actually sing Everton if you like. <laughs> well, um, apparently, the Everton's doing about the same as the Yanks. <laughs> <laughs> They're not undiplomatic. <laughs> Boris Johnson influencer. Oh, stop. <laughs> Please don't. That's all right. I'm <laughs> Do you have a poetry related question, George? Uh, oh, oh, sorry, yeah. No yeah, yeah. A poetry related question, sure. You know, Geraldine did a whole book of, uh, of dialect poems, and I don't think she read from it, but. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the character that you created for that book and what happened with that book. Poems of a Mole Catcher's Daughter. Is that one? Yeah. 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 Um, it kind of it, it grew out of a challenge that George said, I bet you can't write a collection of poems in dialect. And I said, Ha, yes, I can. So I made up this character, uh, it was a Mole Catcher's Daughter. Don't ask me where that came from. But a lot of the stories and poems within that collection were, grew out of the fact that I used to listen to my mum and dad, and my mum especially, and my granddad, tales of Whitehaven, of when they came over from Ireland and settled in West Cumbria. Again, wow. the immigration, it's the migrants and the, and, the, and the language. And I had such fun writing it. And I remember when I was reading in Oakland, at the Laurel Bookstore, courtesy of Jack and Adele Foley. Um, Adele is a, a great loss. Um, and Michael McClure was there, and it was an honor of reading alongside the big poet Michael McClure. And he's actually requested me to read a poem from that collection. And we just had a great fun. Just, it was great from writing it, and it was great from reading it in California. Um, but yes, the mole catcher's daughter. <laughs> and Sal Madge, there's such a lot of characters that um, are very rich. Sal Madge was a, a, a person who my mum knew when she was a, my mum was a little girl and she'd smoke a pipe, that was Sal Madge, and collect coal from the beach at Whitehaven because they were very poor. All those characters are in this collection. The mole catches daughter. Can I ask another question, Robert? Is that right? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, you know, Geraldine obviously clearly is um, you know, very strongly uh, attracted to and influenced by uh, by nature, or what you see in nature. And what if you lived in an ugly place? What would happen? Um, I think I only. Well, yes. I mean, I'm you know, I live in Cumbria, and it, you know, there's lots of ugly places, but. There's also the other side of it. I could have read, I could have read um, about my uncle Owen in his back kitchen playing his saxophone when he lived in a prefab over at Ormsdale and we used to go as kids to the Greyhound races, the dog tracks, which we weren't supposed to. I've written about that. Um, so a very yeah. type of Cumbria is that it's, you know, like it's Lake District, it's beautiful, it's William Wordsworth country, but in fact, you write about uh, working class uh, Cumbria as well. Absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, I've written over two or three poems about working in Vicky's shipyard and um, working down in the Nico submarine dock when I was 17. Yeah. Uh, that's the kind of gritty working class background I come from. And, and Cumbria is a big, as you say, it's a, a wider county than the, the what's portrayed by the Lake District. And, 
romantic poets. And I, I, I welcome that. Yeah. How about how about Kurt Schwitters? Kurt Schwitters, the Merit's poet, spent some time at Cumbria. And what um, relationship have you got with uh, with Schwitters' time in Cumbria? Um, well, I actually read at one of the um, Kurt's celebrations at um, Chapel Style at the Mertz Barn, uh, which is in Longdale. There's actually a reading coming up in September, early September, celebrating Kurt Schwitters' work, celebrating the Mertz Barn. I'm going to try and get along to that. I think it's the 6th of September. Um, can't be too sure, but certainly read there before. And actually, one of the guest poets who read at that celebration was um, Jerome Rothenberg. Uh, and he read from his collection, Shaking the Pumpkin, and it was great fun. And Jeff and I had the pleasure of visiting he and his wife in San Diego um, and reading there. So, yeah. I like the interconnections of people. And, you know, great stuff. Um, Speaking of interconnections, Geraldine, do you have a question for George. Maybe maybe you want to ask him about uh, how the Yankees are doing, or uh, or you could ask about poetry. It's really up to you. <laughs> um, I'd like to know how his gar the garden's going because when whenever we go and stay with he and his wife Peggy, I'm allowed to go on the um, lawn mower and drive it round the lawn, which is one of the key um, pleasures I get. <laughs> in the I have to bless that lawn mower. Have I have to replace that lawn mower. Yes. Yeah. Yes, because um, you damaged it irreconcilably. <laughs> <laughs> I have an excellent new lawn mower, which you're only going to limit your time on. And you can oh. only, because it's six speeds, you can only go at the slowest. <laughs> right. The garden's doing well. It's okay. here for the garden. You know, we had a tree come down, and um, there's a lot, a lot of work from the outside. You know, I love to work in the garden. It's part of a balancing thing for me, so I'm not all up here in my head, and um, and uh, it's been very satisfying. I don't, know, I don't know if you can see my wonderful tan on this show. But, uh, <laughs> yes, thank you, George. <laughs> all right, so the, anything poetry related in closing you want to ask of George before we? Um, I, I remember. I think it, it was the influence as well of vaudeville as well as music. There's quite an influence of theatre. But also perhaps drama that perhaps influences you as a performance poet. Am I, am I right in that, thinking that, George? Vaudeville. Well, I mean, it was the family antecedent. You know, my, my, my father actually, uh, his, my grandfather was uh, worked for the E. coli uh, vaudeville chain in, in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. And my father was a kitty, kitty performer, was a dancer um, in, uh, in vaudeville. So, um, so there is that family connection. He was very outgoing, even behind a bar. He would, you know, he owned bars and restaurants. And he was very entertaining behind the bar. You know, his, his ability to keep a room spinning was part of, was part of who he was. It was part of his MO. So yeah, that's um, that's something that uh, that I think that I probably picked up from my father was the desire. You know, without saying I'm going to do that, was was the desire to be able to do that, to get in the zone, and then make. A Make a room spin. Yes. So yes. yeah, that's definitely. Although I haven't really thought about it, but it's true. Mm -hmm. You know, talk to you about uh, about vaudeville. Jack Foley knows a lot about uh, vaudeville and the connectedness to uh, to poetry. He does. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack. Yes. If Jack's listening at all, thank you, Jack. It's a pleasure staying with, with you and and your wonderful wife, Adele. Um, thank you. Terrific stuff. Well. Great conversation, wonderful poems, good good fun had by all once again. Two minutes, Robert, tell us about you. What's going on with you? <laughs> all is well here, and in in we've got a day of summer here in the UK, which is um, most welcome, but maybe the only day we see this summer, as it's been drizzly and otherwise pretty miserable. And, um, yeah, all's, all's good on the poetry front. Delighted to have you both here and doing this. Um, it remains with me just, uh, of course, to thank both of you tremendously for, for your time, for sharing your work, um, and to remind our audience that if you liked anything you heard tonight, by all means, 
um, go out and seek seek out their books. Um, so the most the most recent is Salt Road, Geraldine Green. That's Indigo Dreams, 2013. And of course, George Wallace's Big 3-0, his 30th, 30th pamphlet, A Simple Blues with a Few Intangibles. And that's coming out with Foothills Publishing uh, in August of this year. Um, I also just want to um, mention our next broadcast coming up. Our next broadcast. Uh, actually, we have two. So for the first time in a long time, in the month of August, we'll have two broadcasts. Uh, the first, uh, hosted by Malika Booker, uh, with Vani Kapladeo and Tahimba Jess, will be on Sunday, August the 14th, uh, same time, so 8 p.m. in the UK, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon on the West Coast. Um, and then uh, Ari Villanueva of Kundaman will be hosting on Wednesday, the 31st of August, at the very end of the month, um, with Fatima Askar and uh, Rina Minigishi. So two terrific readings to look forward to. Finally, I also want to thank uh, the Walt Whitman Birthplace and Erica in particular for supporting George um, and um, George uh, Geraldine's husband for supporting her as well and making all this happen. Uh, delighted to have you both on board um, and um, do tune in next month for more good poetry and interesting conversations around transatlantic poetry. Thanks. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.